Welcome to the Old Library in St Edmund Hall, part of the University of Oxford. And we're going to talk today about two things. We're going to talk about the genesis of this new composition of mine, Zahra Keal, or Flowers of Imagination in translation. And then we're also going to talk about two beautiful percussion instruments, which have been created to be performed within this piece, but as replicas of two of the instruments that were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, uh, the pair of Sistra. And it's wonderful to be with the two people who were here at the very start of this piece, Fatma, Fatma Said, the soprano for whom the piece was written, and Professor Richard Parkinson, who actually the piece was also written for because you were there right at the beginning. And Fatma and I talked about how this piece might come about. And you were really the very first person that I came to. I knew that we wanted to uh, create a piece for soprano and orchestra and that it had something to do with the centenary celebrations of this extraordinary Anglo-Egyptian story um, that happened um, in the 1920s, the discovery and the uncovering of the tomb of Tutankhamun. I think the love songs of Papyrus Harris are very transparent. They speak across the centuries extremely well. They're within a generation or so of Tutankhamun. And they also evoke flowers and garlands, the sorts of thing you find in the tomb and that everybody forgets about. They're really beautiful poems, two complete poems and then one fragment yes. on the end. And as you suggested, um, although they're written such a long time ago, 3,000 plus yes. years, yes. they could have been written yesterday. And you also uh, were able to arrange for me to see the papyrus. And I found that very special and thank you for giving me the crib sheet so that I could follow the text and 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 really sort of get mm -hmm. get to grips with the geography of it mm -hmm. but actually to see mm -hmm. the work of a human hand makes quite yes. a difference to that sort of connecting with the humanity of it I think. We always try to do that with teaching to teach from original objects and I think it makes a huge difference. I came over to visit you in Cairo and uh, we even went into one of the pyramids and and you sang there. There were Before. lots of uh, <laughs> uh, extraordinary acoustic um, in in the burial uh, chamber of the Pyramid of Khafre. Um And that was part of the bit of sound well that I think has gone in into the piece. Uh, you remember that? Um, was that the only time you've ever sung in the pyramid? Yes, that was my first and I hopefully not the last performance in the pyramid. <laughs> I think it was one of the most special moments ever in my mm. life even. I mean, only James was there to witness it because we had uh, just a few minutes. We, we had the pyramid just for ourselves. And it was very interesting to try sounds there, and it was very interesting to, to just you know listen on how how this place is echoing the sounds that we are mm. producing, and it was really really beautiful. One of the questions about the text which emerged was which language it should be sung in. Uh, you translated into English, and that's what caught our eye straight away but there was a, a thought process that actually it should be sung in Arabic mm. and we even had a go at translations into Arabic didn't we Fatma and somehow it just didn't sort of appeal to you quite as much as Richard's original yeah. English translation although we have left some key words in Arabic which is a nice way round that. It's nice also that the Arabic words are mm. the names of the flowers. Yeah. Absolutely. And they give the structure to the poems with wordplay in the original and they really set the framework, yes. Do you remember one of the discussions we had was also about the title of the work and there were various ideas mm. floating around. In the original papyrus they're simply called the songs of entertainment which doesn't really <laughs> tell people much ab about what what they are and the characteristic feature of these songs is the names of the flowers in a garden 
which are taken up in each of the lyrics describing the feelings and the emotions of love. And one of the most beautiful features of the title was that you, Richard, uh, wrote it in hieroglyphs as well. <laughs> it's the only score of mine with a, wow. a title no, in no, hieroglyphs. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for no, doing that. No. We thought it would be quite special to see whether we could commission using the photographs and records and measurements of Howard Carter that are all here in Oxford in the Griffith yes. Institute, see whether we could um, recreate the pair of sistra mm. um, that were found in the ante-chamber. Um, and I worked with um, the symbolsmith, Matt Nolan, on these, who's created, and he's created these beautiful, beautiful instruments. The sistra we know from ancient Egyptian temple reliefs were performed by women, singly and in groups, um, to accompany ritual lyrics. But the debate with Egyptologists is, of course, exactly what do they sound like? The ancient Egyptian name is Seseshet, and it's thought that that references the rustling of papyrus stems. Also, a system, I, I, I read that a system means that that thing or that that can be shaken. So, and there was this very beautiful text that I read by a Greek uh, philosopher who said basically also the sistra or the sistrum, it has kind of also a philosophical meaning because anything in life needs to be mm. shaken to keep its energy and nothing sh sh should ever cease from motion to continue. And I like this very much actually. So Fatma, this is the first time that you get to become acquainted with these wonderful, very beautiful instruments, which exactly replicate in dimensions and also the coloration and design, the instruments found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And we're very pleased to have J.B. Burgess, the renowned percussionist with us to help us, help guide us through what the range of sounds might be. So J.B., um, please do you help yourself me, to a You tell sister. me all about them. <laughs> Um, so the very first sound that comes in the piece is a very shimmering sound, very, very quiet, that goes with gentle strings and a bit of a crescendo and a decrescendo. And I guess there are various techniques for creating that sound. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's going to be about just moving it very, very gently to begin with. And in the piece, there will be two instruments being played. The orchestral percussionist will have an instrument. You also have your instrument. So it will be a kind of duet. And I suppose creating that shimmering sound together produces another colour still. Right, so I'm, I'm, just, yeah, yeah, I'm literally better. just twisting my hand like this to get it going. And if I can see them moving but I can't hear them I think that's absolutely fine okay so we come from Niente I like that yeah, yeah. Sometimes if you can see it moving, you can't hear it. That's, That's a really, amazing. It's yeah. a really good thing. 
kind yeah. of very powerful thing for the for the audience to see. Go trying to listen to that. There's more of a dance uh, section in in the middle, um, where it does need that rather percussive sound. Da 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 da. Um, exactly. My se my sense is that it would be a one handed yeah. action. And that seems to be backed up by most of the depictions as as well. well. I would certainly practice things like going, so one, two, three, four, and then. Wow. Where, the, where the front yeah. is always the same, is on, on the pulse. When you wrote for the Sistrum, James, is this the sound you imagined when you wrote it in the score or something similar or less similar? It's the sound that I hoped for. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Of course, we literally haven't heard these sounds exactly. before. Looking at the instruments and imagining how they might have sounded, that's what I was hoping for. Mm. And, and here it is. <laughs> 